Hello, I'm Richard Reyes Gavilan, Executive Director of the DC Public Library, and I'm here at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library in Washington, DC. We are honored to have 12 Leonardo da Vinci drawings from the Codex Atlanticus on display through August 20th. I am thrilled to be in conversation with Professor Walter Isaacson of Tulane University, author of the New York Times bestseller, Leonardo da Vinci. The first question I want to ask you, uh, Professor, I want you to uh, pretend that you are the marketing director of the DC Public Library. Uh, we're in a large urban public library. I know you lived in DC for a while uh, when you were at the Aspen Institute. Uh, so we're a large library. We're catering to individuals from all walks of life and all levels of education. Um, can you help me convey uh, the significance of the Codex Atlanticus or Leonardo's drawings in general and why people should go out of their way uh, to come see this 12 drawing exhibition. One of the most fascinating things we have in the history of the human mind is Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. You can see a creative genius, page after page, dancing around ideas, letting his mind connect science to art, understanding how swirls of water and the flight of birds work, but then also understanding how his paintings are going to be composed. And so by looking at his notebooks, and we're so lucky that more than 5,000 pages of his notebooks still survive. Paper is a very good storage technology, much better than our computers and phones, because after 500 years, we can still operate it. It has a great battery life. It doesn't have a <laughs> dead. So we get to, and people in Washington get to now, play with the mind of Leonardo by dancing across the pages of his notebooks. Um, you know, I'll say, so we just finished assembling the gallery and it's beautiful. I wish you were in DC and you could come see it, um, but it's a pitch black gallery and the, 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 the drawings are almost suspended in, in air. And the feeling that I had, and I'm not a religious man, but uh, it was almost a religious experience um, coming as close to the hand of God as any mortal could possibly come to. Um, so, uh, and one of, I the think amazing, one of the amazing things is that when you see the notebook pages, you can sense the hand of Leonardo because you see the actual indentations on the pages. You see how he used his pen. You can even, if you look carefully, realize he was left-handed and both the mirror script writing, but the slanting of, this, of the slashes he makes is that of a left-hander. So you feel after 500 years, an intimate connection with Leonardo. Um, yeah, intimate, I think is the, uh, the absolute right word for this. So in terms of your research, um, Professor Isaacson, how much time did you spend at the Ambrosiana um, and how much uh, access did you have to the, to the Codex? One of the uh, joys of writing about Leonardo is I said to my wife, you know, we're gonna have to go around and find and look at his notebook pages. And that means we're gonna have to go to Florence and Milan and Rome and Paris, of course, and Windsor Castle in England, and even Seattle, New York, where Bill Gates has one of them. And it was a wonderful adventure to travel around and do it. And the curators in all of these places were wonderful. And I remember in the in Milan, just being able to see the flight of birds and the Codex Atlantica, and even at Windsor Castle, getting to see some of them. And now people in Washington can just go to the library and see them. So it's a real treat that's being provided. I mean, I was going to ask you how challenging it made it, um, considering their the codices are all over the world. To your point. Um, they were more or less artificially uh, constructed. Yeah. Um, how difficult did it make it for you to construct a sort of a chronological um, uh, tale? One of the miracles is that we still have so many pages of Leonardo. But one of the challenges is after he died, his notebooks were often disassembled. People right. bought a few of the pages. 
Uh, we have things like the Codex Leicester, where the Earl of Leicester in England took some of them and rebound them. And so scholars have had to work and say, what order did he actually do these pages? But because of some great scholarly work in the past 50 years, we get to see exactly which order most of the pages were in. And so we see his mind evolving. We see the scientific method evolving in the Codex Atlanticus because we see him try different experimental things and then try some other theories. So it's a great chronology of a mind at work. And so you mentioned in, in the book that, you know, as many details of his life uh, that he pours into these notebooks, he doesn't date any of these sheets. Um, and so are you saying that through recent scholarship, um, we more or less can put a chronology on on the notebooks at this point, or would those dates really help if we had had them? I had the joy of working with a wonderful translator named Marco Chianti, who's still around. And he had worked with Carlo Pedretti, an earlier scholar of Leonardo. And they spent a lot of time trying to date each page of the notebook. I think it would probably have been useful if Leonardo had dated each page, but it actually is more fun and exciting as we try to recreate the chronology because it's like a mystery story. It's like a puzzle. And by engaging in that puzzle, I think we get to understand Leonardo better. Um, and speaking of understanding Leonardo better, now you personalize him in a way that readers really feel um, that they get to know him as a, as a person. You highlight that he was um, a real outsider. Um, he was gay, he was left-handed, um, he was a vegetarian. Um, Tell me a little bit about um, your, your affection for him and, and what contributes to that affection. I think that creative people often are people who feel like they're a bit outsiders, uh, that they don't fully fit in. And so they spend a search for how do I fit into this cosmos in which I find myself. And Leonardo da Vinci uh, was a bit of a misfit. He was left-handed. He was born out of wedlock. He was gay. He was distracted, and yet he wanders from the village of Vinci uh, as a young teenager to the town of Florence, and the Medici family totally embraces him. And so I think we see that the diversity and that embrace of diversity, which we have in the great cities that are creative in our world today, was so crucial even 500 years ago. Um, so do you have any uh, sort of favorite notebook pages or any that stand out to you among the thousands that exist um, that stand out as perfect examples of his quirkiness or 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 his you know his genius or or anything else there are certain pages that I have in my book that have him dancing from field to field to field my favorite which begins my book is a swirl of clouds, and then a mountain, then the craggy old man and his young boyfriend, uh, who he nicknamed Salai, pictures of them, but also then how the spirals of the wind and the spirals of the cloud are reflected in spirals of water, and then spirals in the curls of the hair of Salai, his boyfriend. And so you see a playful curiosity a playful exploration of a mind dancing from topic to topic. And we see how his curiosity about mathematics and squaring the circle and about spirals leads to pieces of art uh, culminating in the smile of the Mona Lisa and the curls of her hair. Um, so something that I couldn't glean from your biography. Now, did, did Leonardo know quite how special he was or was he too eccentric to uh, realize how um, how much of a genius he was, perhaps the greatest genius of all humankind? He did realize that he was the person in his time who best tried to know everything that was possibly knowable then. And there are very few people in history like that. You know, Aristotle, I like to think Ben Franklin was a bit that way, tried to know everything. So he realized that understanding many disciplines helped him see the patterns 
across nature? I don't know, and this is a wonderful question, whether at that period, say around 1500 in Florence, people knew they were at the beginning of the Renaissance. For example, we knew when the digital revolution, the computer revolution began, or even the artificial re intelligence revolution has begun this year, we say, wow, things are changing. I kind of wonder whether Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael woke up and said, wow, we're at the beginning of the Renaissance. Leonardo did not fully understand the specialness of what he was doing, which is why he didn't date his notebook pages, why he didn't sign his paintings. So it leaves us with sort of puzzles and detective stories where we have to figure out how much of that painting was really his. When was that notebook page written? And I think if he thought that he was some genius that we'd be studying 500 years later, he would have signed all of his paintings, he would dated all of his notebook pages. But as I say, I think the fact that he didn't makes it more fun to engage with him. Um, I, I, you know, I've not read your other biographies, Professor, um, but I just can't imagine that this wasn't the most fun you've ever had writing a biography, more, more so than anyone you've ever written about. One of the things that made writing about Leonardo Flum was the joy of looking at his notebooks. We all know his paintings. You know, we know the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, and there aren't many paintings, maybe 15 at most. I would urge people coming to the DC Public Library to see the only painting he ever did that is now in North America, which is Ginevra da Benci at the National Gallery right down the street from you in Washington. Uh, and that has the curls of hair. It has the river flowing in. So we see the hand of the notebook and the hand of the painter there. But yes, it was an enormous amount of fun to be able to engage with a mind as playful as Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so you you just mentioned the river. And uh, so the 12 drawings that we've got here specifically that are on display um, are those things that you would imagine coming from the Codex Atlanticus? Um, there are drawings on hydraulics. Um, there's a you know, digging machine. Um, the, the, the obsession with water and rivers, and we see it in his paintings, and we see it all over the notebooks. What, what is it about water um, that so captivated Leonardo? I just did uh, Leonardo and his waters at the Kennedy Center, which is based somewhat on the fact that you have this exhibition about to open. And Leonardo da Vinci, when he's leaving Florence as a young man and trying to get a job in Milan, he describes himself in an 11 paragraph letter to the ruler of Milan. And he begins by saying what a good engineer he is. He said, I can divert the course of rivers. I can make canals, I can make weapons of war. Only in the last paragraph does he say, and I can also paint as well as any person. So he thought of himself as an engineer, but he was particularly fascinated from his very childhood with how water flows and how it spirals when it passes a rock and what the ripples look like. The very first drawing we have that he does has the flow of the river uh, near his home in Vinci. Likewise, the first painting we know of is when he helped his teacher, Verrocchio, do the baptism of Christ. And Leonardo does the River Jordan and the spirals around the ankles of Christ. So those notebook pages showing the flow of rivers and hydraulic science, not only is interesting to understand his mind as an engineer, but also to understand his mind as an artist. You know, we've also got a couple of um, uh, drawings on display. We've got a couple of perpetual motion uh, carts or machines. And uh, then we've also got a couple of uh, uh, wing wing studies. So I guess it's not relegated just to, just to rivers and currents, but it's anything uh, that moves. Uh, so, you know, anything uh, more that you wanted to add on just the concept of motion in Leonardo? Well, Everything Leonardo, seems to be always, motion. Leonardo, as an engineer, always tried to do the flying machine. He has the famous thing that sort of looks like a helicopter with this, once again, the spiral pattern that he loved as a lifting screw for the helicopter. 
he did a codex, a set of notebooks, just on the flight of birds. And then in the notebooks that you have on display, he's showing other ways to do flying machines. He also tried very hard to do a perpetual motion machine. You have to remember, this is before Newton came along. And so he thought there was a hope that we could figure out perpetual motion. But by experimenting, experimenting in the real world with the physical objects, but also experimenting on paper with his drawings, he finally figured out you could not make a perpetual motion machine. Um, so as we, we begin to wrap up, uh, Professor, um, you mentioned that there were maybe 5,000 drawings or so uh, extant. Is that what's, what's, what's currently left? I think there's probably 7,000 notebook okay. pages, 5,000 of which have really beautiful drawings. Others are just shopping lists sometimes. We right. know what to make because he put in his notebook uh, what he was sending his salai, his assistant, to go buy in the marketplace. But what you have at the library in Washington are the notebook pages that show his mind as an engineer and artist, which is the way he thought of himself. And it's the ones with the drawings that are so magical. Um, did he have, as far as you can tell, um, any posthumous expectations of these notebooks? Um, they weren't published during his lifetime. Did he mean for them to be published? Did he want this to be um, shared with the world for Posterity, can you talk a little bit about what you know or what you can infer? Yeah, he, um, he talked, um, he wrote quite a bit as if he were going to try to publish his notebooks. He called them, you know, there'd be notebooks on motion, notebooks on birds, and they are put together initially with the thought of publication. But you have to remember that the year Leonardo was born in 1452, is when Gutenberg creates the first press. So we don't have a big publishing industry by the time Leonardo is a teenager. And in the end, he never published any of his notebooks. I think he was hoping that one of his assistants was going to compile them after his death. And some of them were indeed published then. But it, one of the things that's a shame in history is most of the notebooks were not available right away and so things get rediscovered a century later um you, you mentioned that he 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 wasn't uh didn't have a formal education <clears throat> and he didn't know latin and latin was of course the language of scholarship um uh towards the end of the 15th century what impact was his uh limitation basically he only spoke and wrote italian that had did that have any role in um I think that you could long term I think, dissemination. I think I think excuse me, do you want to finish or you want me to answer? No, 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 go go right ahead. I think you I, could argue sorry. Uh, apologies. Um Why I think you caught me the question. I did. I think you could argue that his lack of formal education was actually a benefit, not a burden. And in some ways, the fact that he tried to teach himself Latin but was never very great at Latin helped him become what he called a disciple of experiment and a disciple of experience, as opposed to a disciple of received wisdom. I mean, during the dark ages before the Renaissance, people thought there wasn't much left to be discovered you were just supposed to read uh, the experts and the, become disciples of what had already been discovered. Leonardo looks at the world afresh because he hasn't had pounded into his head at a university the received wisdom of the ages. And he can read some of the books, especially those that have been translated, but many things, especially math and mechanics and engineering, and art and perspective, he has to discover from his own experiments. So I think in some ways, he's a testament to a self-taught person who tries to teach himself things 
rather than just accepting the wisdom that's been handed down. You know, uh, the the more I read about Leonardo, it's like, but he would have thrived working in libraries. Um, you know, we are just full of autodidacts who uh, want to learn as much as we can about so many subjects that we've got within our walls. Um, he would have been a probably a, a horrible staff member, but he would have he would have really loved working here. <laughs> Leonardo kept in his notebooks a list of the various books that he wanted or that he had bought. And you can, it's just watching his mind grow. You could say he wants a copy of the Euclid that's at the stationers by the bridge in Florence. And he sees if he can get it. He's borrowing books. And by the end of his life, he's accumulated an enormous quantity, 400, 500 books. And so you see the role of books, of publishing, of Florence having become by 1500 a publishing center how that helps him be self-taught. And this, I think, is one of the reasons the Renaissance happens, is that wisdom is not something uh, that is reserved only for the elite, but people like Leonardo, a misfit runaway from the village of Vinci, could learn Euclid, could learn perspective, could learn math, could learn science and medicine and anatomy, and then discover more by his own experiments. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor. I'm gonna ask a question that I think you've already answered at the outset, but I think it's good to to, to wrap things up. Um, what, what would you hope that visitors um, to this exhibition will leave feeling or, or knowing? I think when you look at his notebook pages, first of all, you'll feel an intimate connection with them because you can actually see his hand almost as it puts impressions on the paper. You see which way he used his pen and his left hand. Secondly, you'll see a playful but curious mind at work as it dances through everything from the flow of waters and the creation of machinery to sketches for his paintings. And by seeing how a creative mind works, and feeling intimately connected to that mind is not only inspiring, it'll be joyful. Um, maybe last thing, uh, Professor, I know, I believe that there might be a, a, a movie version of your biography in the works. Is that is that still there happening? Two, there are two things that'll be coming out soon. Uh, Ken Burns has just finished an amazing documentary on Leonardo da Vinci, which I was proud to be part of. Uh, they're just editing it now, so it'll be out in perhaps a year. And likewise, the rights to my book have been bought and they're still writing the screenplay for the movie. But of course, Hollywood works in mysterious ways and they're on writer's strike. So who knows when that will happen. Yeah, yeah, I've got to say that uh, this could make a pretty cool uh, rap musical as well. So I don't know if you've sent your book to uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, but yeah. I'd love to see Leonardo rapping. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure he would be very good at it. There's so much about Leonardo that's fun. And even his relationship with Michelangelo, a very tense rivalry. That's a stuff of a wonderful movie waiting to be made. Exactly how he did the smile of the Mona Lisa which involves optics and science and dissecting the human face, as well as understanding the depths of human emotions. All of these things you see in the notebooks and you see how his mind created both the greatest art and the greatest engineering ideas of his time. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. I cannot Thanks. tell you how much I appreciate you taking some time this morning. Uh, to be with us. We're going to repackage our little conversation and it's going to live on our website uh, throughout the exhibition. Uh, I don't assume you'll be in DC over the next couple of months, but uh, but if you happen to make I it- I do, I'll keep it in mind. Please, please drop by. Thank you so much. And thank you for really writing one of the phenomenal books um, uh, that I've ever read. I'm making everyone crazy about reading it. And uh, and uh, my wife just picked it up um, uh, yesterday or day before. And, and here we go. I appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing with this exhibition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Isaacson, for joining us. 
You can find copies of Walter Isaacson's best-selling book, Leonardo da Vinci, at our neighborhood libraries or online through the library's Libby app. The special exhibition, Imagining the Future, Leonardo da Vinci in the Mind of an Italian Genius, will be at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library through August 20th. Visit us at dclibrary.org for more information.